I want to say a big thank you and invite you to help me thanking our uh, sponsors that make Natural's Journeys possible. So our lead sponsors are Hunter Mountain Co-op and 802 Coffee. So a round of applause. <laughs> and um, also want to say a big thanks to our other sponsors, Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix, Northfield Savings Bank, Concept to Capital Copy, Union Mutual, Iron River Outdoors, and the Washington Electric Co-op. So thanks again. <laughs> Well, uh, Lucas and I met over some Sawat owls this uh, October, and we got talking about various things, only to learn that uh, Lucas is a uh, academically decorated uh, researcher um, with, uh, let's see, so undergraduates and PhD from West Virginia University, masters from Central Michigan University, currently working at uh, Dartmouth as a postdoc. Postdoc uh, studying deer tick ecology. Um, and so uh, after we got done talking about owls, we schemed a plan to bring you back up here from Dartmouth to uh, talk about uh, deer ticks and all things ticks, since it's a topic that I know we're all wondering about, especially as our snow melts away and we start thinking about early spring. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming Lucas. Thank you, Sean. Um, so as he said, I'm up here from Dartmouth College. So I just started there back in June, so about I don't know, eight or ten months into my postdoc now, uh, working on research at the university. Uh, for my doctorate, I also did work on black-legged ticks, um, which is the name that deer ticks get referred to more commonly. So as I'm saying black-legged ticks in this talk, um, that is the same thing as a deer tick. They were kind of renamed. Um, so just keep that in mind as I'm going through the talk. Uh, with that, we can go ahead and jump in. And kind of my thought for this is we'll go through, you know, the history of black-legged deer ticks um, and then kind of talk about Lyme disease, where that comes into it, where the ticks come into it, some of the research going on at Dartmouth, and kind of what all you can do to be safe around ticks and be more careful about picking them up in diseases. So as a lot of you might know, this story starts in Lyme, Connecticut. Um, so as you can imagine from the name Lyme, this is actually the location where Lyme disease was named for. So in Lyme, Connecticut, they noticed back in about 1975 that they had this group of children was really what tipped it off, but also adults that were experiencing arthritic symptoms. So they were having arthritis in these really young kids uh, and kind of wondering where this was coming from. It wasn't just like one or two isolated cases. There was a group of children that were having these symptoms. It was really abnormal. In 1977, the first 55 cases of what they then termed Lyme arthritis were described in this region. And so those 55 cases were some of these children and adults in that area. Around the same time in 1977, they actually linked this back to the black-legged tick. So they figured out that black-legged ticks uh, were linked to the transmission of Lyme uh, to different people within this region. From there, in 1982, they actually figured out what was causing Lyme disease. And what causes Lyme disease is a pathogen called uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. And so what Borrelia burgdorferi is, is it's a bacterium, and it's called a spirochete bacterium. So as you can see from the image over here, they are in this spiral-type pattern, which is why they're called a spirochete, not super original. Um, but that is why uh, it is called a spirochete bacterium. Also, if at any point you feel like uh, you need more of a definition of a term I'm using, or just feel free to speak up. I'm glad to explain things farther or if there's something I didn't make clear. Um, feel free to speak up as I'm going through. Uh, yeah. What is the measurement that's there? It says one, and then there's one symbol. A uh, UM. So the UM stands for micro. So it's a micrometer, but you might be able to correct me. I think that's point zero 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 one meters. So very, very small measurement. Yeah. So in 1984, they actually developed a serological test that was able to allow them to detect this pathogen within people. And then by 1991, there was actually federal funding uh, for research on Lyme disease and black-legged ticks. So that's where a lot of this research starts. Um, that's where we start to get a better idea of what's going on with this picture that started in Lyme, Connecticut. So some of what we'll see in Lyme disease, we have a group of early symptoms. And then if you don't find Lyme disease and treat it early, they'll develop into later symptoms. Your early symptoms are very easy to confuse for other things. Um, they're basically your generalist flu-like symptoms. Uh, so you can have you know, a fever, chills, headache, fatigue, muscle and joint aches, um, and these swollen lymph nodes. 
And you know, nowadays you can confuse that with a cold, you can confuse it with the flu, you now have COVID, you can confuse it with. So it's really easy to get these symptoms and not realize that you have Lyme disease. Uh, this erythema migrans, the rash. So this is that telltale rash you hear about with Lyme disease. Essentially what, you, what occurs is you have the central point where the tick bite is, and then you have a rash that radiates out. So this rash will grow over time, and it clears interior as it's growing outwards, which gives us this bull, bullseye-like shape. And that's really your telltale sign that you might have Lyme disease. Uh, the issue with that is that it only occurs in about 70 to 80% of Lyme cases. So just because you didn't get the rash doesn't mean you might not have Lyme disease. Um, so that's a great symptom to look for, but realistically you want to be making sure that, you know, if you have a tick bite, you're trying to identify it because um, you might not always get that rash. So it's good to be cautious when you're talking about early symptoms of Lyme disease. If I'm not mistaken, the rash can manifest on other parts of your body where you might not have gotten the bite, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know if you're going to address it later, but um, in terms of the history, did they know if Lyme in Connecticut was brought from somewhere else, or was it always there, and did they know they got it, or did it mutate from here to there? Uh, so Lyme disease seems to be pretty historic to the region, like the black legged tick was. Yeah. So I will talk a bit about why those fluctuations yeah. occurred. Yep. So if you don't catch it during this early Lyme, you can develop into these later symptoms. Um, so that early Lyme, you're talking you know, days to weeks after you get bit from a tick. Later Lyme can be within days, but typically you're thinking more months to years for these later Lyme symptoms to occur. So what will happen is you'll get those flu-like symptoms. Those symptoms will disappear. You'll think you're better. And then these later symptoms can occur later down the road if you didn't get treated for Lyme disease. So one of the really common ones is this arthritis with swelling. So this image here is showing you an example of what the swelling can look like on your knee. You can also have nerve pain. So this can affect your nervous system, uh, your spinal cord, your brain tissue, your nerves, and your joints and cause pain there. It can also lead to things like an irregular heartbeat um, and severe headaches and neck stiffness if not treated early on. Are you going to talk about sending the tick bits that you had embedded to a lab? Yeah, so when I get to preventative stuff, that's going to be an option I talk Great. about. Yep. Thank you. So from there, we basically can work back, and now the CDC in about 1998 started keeping track of reported cases of Lyme disease. Um, so these reported cases, they had a pretty good standard definition for, um, and reports really have to come from a doctor to be included in this data set. Uh, so we can see from 98 to about 2008, uh, where you have these confirmed cases, you see a really steady increase in the number of Lyme cases from that time period. Uh, and then in 2008, that's when they first started defining probable cases. There's a reason that's why probable cases first shows up in 2008. So those are cases where they think it's Lyme, but they don't quite have enough evidence to say for sure that it was Lyme disease. Uh, and since those probable cases were defined in 2008, there's been a pretty steady increase in those ever since. And so there's kind of two different reasons why we might be seeing this increase in Lyme disease. Uh, one reason is we do believe that Lyme disease is on the rise. We do believe there are more cases every year. One of the other things that's on the rise is awareness. So more people are aware of Lyme disease, more doctors are aware of Lyme disease. So they're doing a better job of detecting it when it occurs. So this increase isn't purely due to an increase in cases, it's also due to an increase in detection. Is it also an increase in territory because it's spreading? Yes, so there is an increase in territory, but CDC is US numbers. Um, a lot of the U.S. is pretty established now. Um, the, really, the range of extension now is still northern Maine, sure, um, but Canada is where Texas is starting to move to now, so that won't really affect the CDC numbers too much. Is that because of climate? Warming? Yeah. And so if we look at our 2019 reported cases, we can kind of see the geographic distribution of Lyme disease across the U.S. And so we're really seeing two major hotspots. We have a hotspot in the Midwest, which is really centered around uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota still caused by the black-legged tick, so the same tick species there. Uh, and then the strongest hotspot for Lyme disease is the Northeast, where we are now. Um, one of the other things you'll notice on this map is that Massachusetts doesn't really have any reported cases. <laughs> um, so the reason for that is actually that Massachusetts redefined what a confirmed case is. So they record cases differently than the rest of the states in the region, and so therefore they don't go into the CDC system. And now you might think well, that's kind of an error with Massachusetts, but other states are actually looking to what Massachusetts is doing and starting to change their reporting system to match Massachusetts. It's kind of an evolving of how numbers are being reported. 
Uh, there's also a report of a third hotspot out on the west coast. So this is caused by a different tick species, the western black-legged tick. Uh, but you can see it's not nearly as strong as the other two hotspots. And so as I was mentioning, Lyme disease is caused by our black-legged tick or our deer tick. So here is the tick that we're dealing with. Um, it's the primary tick you'll see in this region, but there are a couple other species that you might find around. Um, this is one of the ones of more concern that you would see. And so ticks go through these three different life stages. And we're able to tell apart the life stages based off these morphological characteristics, the um, physical characteristics of these species. So when it comes to a larval tick, they're really, really small, um, like almost impossible to see small. And they also have six legs instead of eight, so that will really tell you that you have a larval tick. And then the shell pattern can be used to identify the different species, so this is what that shell pattern looks like on a black-legged tick. Uh, once that tick will feed, it'll molt to the next life stage, which is your nymph, and your nymph will have eight legs. Uh, but they're still smaller than your adults, and they really have this unique shell pattern. So you see in the adults, they have more of a, a single color pattern that's primary, and the adult male will have this outer lining on the shell, but really just a single unique color. And then the females will have this orange outer shell uh, with a different colored inside. But when you come down to the nymphs, you see more of a model pattern in the back of their shell here. Um, so the size can help you tell them apart, along with... Um, the different color patterns that you'll see. And so when you're dealing with black-legged ticks, black-legged ticks don't just have Lyme disease, they aren't born with Lyme disease. Um, they actually pick up Lyme disease from wildlife species. So wildlife are what we call a reservoir um, for Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen that causes it. And so we see this that Borrelia actually lives in different wildlife species. And also, with the wildlife species, they aren't born with Lyme disease either. It doesn't pass from mother to offspring. It has to get passed by a tick. It's very, very rare within a mammal even that uh, Borrelia will pass from mother to offspring. So you're mainly getting tick distributing this different pathogen around. And so here are a couple of examples. So your squirrel, uh, this is a white-footed mouse, which is a really reservoir for Lyme disease. It's really good at picking up and passing on Lyme disease. Talk about that a little more later, um, where you might see this in nature. And so here is your tick life cycle. So this is kind of how a tick goes through life. Um, our eastern black-legged tick goes through a two-year life cycle. And so that two-year life cycle starts with eggs that are laid in the springtime. Those eggs will hatch out in the late summer. So typically up here, I would expect to see larval ticks around July or August. Um, like I said, larval ticks aren't born with Borrelia burgdorferi, they aren't born with Lyme disease. So if you get bit by a larval tick, there is pretty zero chance of infection from that tick because it can't have obtained it yet. The ticks have to obtain a blood meal um, from a wildlife species that's infected with Lyme before it's able to pass it on. So larval ticks might be irritating, they might cause you a rash, um, but they're not going to give you Lyme disease if they feed on you. And so that's what you're going to see in July or August. Um, once that larval tick feeds, It'll basically go under the leaf litter for the winter and molt to the next life stage, which will be your nymph. So you see larval feeding here in summer. They go the whole way around until the next spring and summer when they'll appear as the nymph with their eight legs. And at this point, if a nymph is fed on a wildlife species that was infected, it can now pass on the pathogen. So nymph is where you really have to start worrying about Lyme disease, not the larval ticks. Um, the other reason you really have to worry about nymphs is that they're about the size of, uh, you know, like... If you have a pencil, the tip of that pencil is about the size of a nymph. They're very small. Um, so while a nymph has only had one chance to pick up Lyme disease, it's really hard to find them if they're feeding on you. It's hard to identify them. It's hard to locate them and pull them off yourself, which is why nymphs are really a big concern when it comes to Lyme disease. Once that nymph has fed, it'll go back under the leaf litter. And so nymphs you'll typically see uh, this far north, I would say primarily June. You might get them into July. That's when nymphs are primarily going to be out for black-legged ticks. Once they've fed, they'll go back under the leaf litter. Uh, and then they'll actually emerge that same year. So a nymph that feeds in early summer will reappear as an adult in the fall. So that's within that same year that a nymph goes to an adult. Uh, and once again, they go under the leaf litter, they molt to that next life stage. And so at this point, an adult tick could have obtained Lyme during either its larval blood meal or its nymph blood meal. So there's a higher probability that your adult ticks have Lyme disease but the good thing about the adult ticks is that they're a lot larger. They're at least twice the size of a the nymph. They're, they tend to be found by people rather than being able to complete their blood meal before getting removed. So you have a better chance of actually finding them and removing them. Yeah? So blood meal, um, 
they yeah. have to get this or they don't necessarily, what else do they eat? Yeah, so they just eat blood. That's it. Uh-huh. Yep, so they have to get a blood meal to go up to the next life stage. Mm. Yes. And so... They need only one, so in other words, they bite yes. one person, mm-hmm. they get their blood meal, and that's it. Yes. Yep. Um, so there are some reported where maybe a tick doesn't finish a blood meal, and it'll go to a second host to finish it, but that's thought to be pretty rare. Um, so when you're dealing with a larval tick, they'll complete a blood meal within about a day or so. A nymph will take, you know, about three to seven days, somewhere in that time frame, to complete a blood meal, and the adult will probably be about a week or a little longer to complete a blood meal. Um, and so they have to complete it to go to the next life stage. The benefit that the adult has is if they don't complete a blood meal in the fall, they can actually overwinter. And so when you have adult ticks out in the spring, they're ticks that are left over that didn't complete their blood meal in the fall. So it's that same cohort of ticks showing back up in the springtime. Once they've obtained their blood meal, they'll lay their eggs and then the life cycle will start over again. Um, for the most part, adult ticks will actually breed on that final blood meal host. And so the reason they were called deer ticks is because historically it was believed that they had to feed on deer and they had to reproduce on deer to continue their life cycle. Um, the reason it's been changed to black-legged ticks is that deer are still really important, but they can find other hosts if they don't find a deer. So they're not completely reliant on deer to get that final blood meal and reproduce. And so in this, your host species really matters. The species that ticks are feeding on makes a big difference in how this life cycle goes, whether they obtain Lyme disease, um, how they go forward from there. And so there are a few different factors that matter. Um, your first is your ticks per an animal. So obviously if you have a larger animal, it can support more ticks. Um, so you need fewer of them to feed as many ticks than if you're dealing with smaller animals. So that can have an influence. Uh, but also your feeding success on different wildlife is really important. So what we have here is some research that came out in 2009. Um, and so essentially what Keesing did is he took wildlife species and put them into a lab setting. And then he dumped a known number of ticks onto these different wildlife species. So he put them over water tanks and he saw how many ticks successfully fed and dropped off from these different wildlife species. And from that we get an idea of how successful ticks are in feeding on different species. So we can see our mouse here, which is really good at passing on Lyme disease. A lot of ticks finish their blood meal from this. About half the ticks that were put on finish their blood meal. Um, but if we see down here at the opossum, you know, about 5% that were put on completed their blood meal. So if you've heard that opossums eat a lot of ticks, if you've heard that before, it's not like opossums are walking around the landscape eating ticks. That's really not how they live. It's more the fact that if they get ticks on them, they're really good at grooming the ticks off. And so the ticks die as they get on the opossums. Um, it's still thought that this kind of oversold how important opossums are in controlling ticks, but that's where um, that idea came from. And then once again, this is that reservoir competency. So that's the ability to contract and pass on Borrelia burgdorferi, to pass on Lyme disease. So not all things are created equal. Um, for example, deer are not very good at catching Lyme disease, and they're not very good at passing it on to ticks that feed on them. Um, so they're not super important in um, promoting Lyme disease on the landscape, but they are good for getting blood meals and reproducing. So they kind of serve a different purpose. White-footed mice, on the other hand, are very good at catching Lyme, very good at pe- catching Borrelia burgdorferi, and passing it on to ticks that feed on them in the future. So these white-footed mice become really important in the tick life cycle and the Lyme disease system. How does the Lyme um, affect the species? It really doesn't. Um, They might have mild arthritis symptoms, but humans are an incidental host. We aren't meant, like Lyme disease didn't, you know, come on the planet to infect us. If it comes into us, it's a dead end. It doesn't get passed on to anything else. It's not here for us. Whereas the wildlife species that are promoting it and passing it on co-evolved. So they, they, the pathogen evolved to not really severely affect those, but they use it successfully to pass on and stay in the landscape. And so that kind of brings us to the transmission of how does this actually pass on from different wildlife species. So when we're talking about Borrelia burgdorferi, it actually lives in the tick's gut. Um, So when a tick picks this up, it'll stay in the gut. It'll basically stay there until the next blood meal occurs. And when that tick's feeding, the bacteria will then start to replicate and migrate to the salivary glands. So if you hear that you have, you know, 36 to 72 hours to remove a tick before you get infected, this is generally why because it takes that long for the pathogen to replicate and then spread to the salivary glands or it can spread to the host that's being fed on. Um, So that's really how this lives within the tick system. And then here, one of the things I wanted to talk about um, was the spread of black-legged ticks in the Northeast. 
So as I mentioned, black-legged ticks have pretty much always been here. They are a native species to this area. Um, but what really affected it was kind of how the landscape has changed over time. So, you know, as people came in and they colonialized the area, they cut down a whole bunch of the trees, they deforested it, they used it for livestock, they used it for agriculture. Um, and that basically reduced the habitat that ticks could live in, that the wildlife that they feed on could live in, and made it less of an issue earlier in time. But now as we move through time, and agriculture is less of an industry, and especially less in the Northeast, you know, if you go hiking through the woods and you see those old stone walls, those are kind of our remnants of what used to be ag land that's now reforested. Well, that's really promoted habitat for white-footed mice. So white-footed mice thrive when they have these small patches of forest. So if you have small patches of forest in urban areas, those mice do really well there. Um, they're just a generalist species that does well when other things don't. Um, and then also that land cover change influence other wildlife species like deer. So deer can do well in those forested systems as well which provide more blood meals and more breeding opportunities for the ticks. Also with deer in the region, obviously early on in time, there was more intense hunting that really drove down deer numbers. And so as deer numbers have recovered, that has also influenced the system. Yeah. Can other animals get infected by eating mouse? Uh, not as far as I know. I haven't heard of any do you know of any research on that? I've never heard of that being a case where right. yeah. It has to go through the Yes, as far as I know. Yep. How does climate change affect Yeah, so what climate change has done is it's opened the landscape farther. So essentially ticks are restricted by really cold temperatures. They need a certain temperature threshold before they're able to survive in a landscape. And so as the climate's been changing, as these areas get warmer, but then also um, humidity is good for ticks. It helps them survive from drying out. So both of those things can really help them expand to new areas. So as the climate's been changing, the big shift we're seeing now is them expand in the northern Maine, but also seeing them expand into Canada now. So a lot of the research on the cutting edge, the front edge of this, is black-legged ticks expanding into Canada. So if we look at the map here, this is um, 96 and 2015. What our red is representing is area where ticks have been confirmed, they're established. Um, so what this study did is it went through any public record it could find for records of ticks in the area, and it said, okay, within a single year, did you find six ticks in a county? Within a single year, did you find two different life stages? If you met either of those, they said that that county was established. And that's what the red represents. The blue represents any county where there was at least one report within a year. And so we can see from 96 to 2015 uh, that a lot of this area has been reclassified from reported to established as the ticks have moved farther north. Um, some of this also has to do to more attention to the issue though, because obviously as you look more, you're gonna find more. So. Um, I noticed that, that also, south, uh, southeast seems to be less and less ticks. Does overheating also be a problem for them? Or? Yes, so overheating can be a problem, but a lot of the southeast has enough moisture that they can survive it, because um, it's really the overheating causes them to dry out and die. So the moisture can help with that. What you really see in the southeast isn't that there aren't ticks there, it's that the ticks live a different life cycle. Um, so they've actually found genetic differences between the north and the south, where ticks in the south tend to feed lower. So they feed more in the leaf litter rather than climbing up vegetation to look for blood meals. And so humans encounter the ticks less, which is why there's less Lyme disease cases down there. Um, there's also different hosts for them to feed on which can alter that, that system. And so from this, there's some different habitat influence. So I was talking about soil moisture. Um, a lot of these factors, what they do is they protect ticks from drying out. Um, desiccation or drying out is the primary way that a tick will die before obtaining a blood meal. Um, so if you have soil moisture, the ticks can go down into the soil layer during really extreme temperatures and better survive from drying out. Um, forested landscapes also provide overstory, so that overstory can break up sun and temperature from getting lower, and the vegetation can provide more moisture in the landscape as well to help with that. Then of course, forested landscapes is where a lot of the hosts that they prefer are found as well. Understory growth will do the same thing with sheltering them, but it also provide habitat um, for them to climb up and look for their next blood meal. So the understory helps with that. Um, canopy cover is kind of tied back to your forest. More canopy cover is you know, more protection. And then leaf litter comes back to the soil moisture as well. If you have more leaves on the ground, they can get under that leaf litter for protection from those extreme temperatures. And then we find the same thing with snow cover in the winter. So there's been research coming out now that if you have more continuous snow cover, it'll insulate the ticks and keep them from dying from extreme cold over the winter. So snow cover will actually help protect ticks that are under the leaf layer. 
One of the other things that's been being researched is the influence of mast. So when I'm talking about mast, I'm talking about um, nuts or fruits of trees and shrubs. So think acorns is the primary one we're interested in here. Um, and so what's been found is that acorns will influence wildlife species, primarily your white-footed mice, which will then influence your tick populations. And so there's been some research showing that acorn, uh, acorn production, the amount of acorns you have in the landscape will predict the amount of nymphs you'll have, of nymph black legged ticks, two years later. So we can kind of use this to get an idea of when tick populations might be high. Obviously there's other factors that go into it, but this is something that's being looked at as well. Um, and so this picture here is actually one of the ways you can go out and look at mast. Um, so this is just a bucket system, and it's made to collect acorns as they fall from the trees. And then you can go through, dry that out, weigh it, and get an idea of how mass changes from year to year. Yeah? You said that the ticks overwinter in leaf litter. Do they ever overwinter on a host? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. No, they don't, um, they don't stay on a host long enough to overwinter. Right. And so finally, the last category I want to talk about here is wildlife influences on tick populations. Um, so typically, these are the, the factors we look at. So when we think about wildlife diversity, um, we think about this actually hurting ticks on the landscape, like legged like ticks. So the reason for this is that things like your white-footed mouse do really well um, when other things don't. So when you have a whole bunch of different wildlife species on the landscape, you know, ticks are very opportunistic. They're feeding on what comes past them. And so if you have different species, then they're less likely to find a mouse to feed on. And so if they don't feed on a mouse, there's more likely that they'll get groomed off and not complete their blood meal. And it's more likely that they won't pick up Borrelia burgdorferi, which is best passed on by those mouse species. So as you have more wildlife diversity, that can help um, tame down your tick system, help control things for the future. Um, and so kind of the inverse of that is if you have a really large small mammal population, uh, that can be good for ticks. Because ticks feed well on small mammals, and small mammals tend to be better at passing on Borrelia burgdorferi to what feeds on them. And then that also comes back to your predator abundance. So your predator can help control those small mammals if you have them. But in addition to controlling them, they also change the behavior of small mammals. So when you have predators on the landscape, things like mice and squirrels and chipmunks, they spend less time out foraging, and they actually spend more time being protective of themselves. They stay closer to cover. Um, they you know, limit their time out being exposed. And by them limiting their movement due to predators, they limit their exposure to ticks as well. So there's kind of all different ways that these wildlife systems are interconnected to ticks. So I've spent most of this talking about Lyme disease. That's what my research primarily focuses around, that black-legged ticks, but that's obviously not the only disease we have. Um, so here's a few other ones that you'll find in the region. All of these are carried by black-legged ticks. Um, so you have anaplasmosis, which is another bacterium. Um, one of the things with these is pretty much all of them cause flu-like symptoms that are pretty similar. Um, but Lyme is the worst one that if you don't catch it and treat it, you can have problems later, except for this uh, virus down here, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so anaplasmosis is caused by another bacteria. You have a babesiosis, which is really interesting to me, but not to you. Um, <laughs> so it's a microscopic parasite. So it's a parasite that's about the size of a red blood cell. And so what happens is the tick will pass it to you. It'll live in your bloodstream. And it actually uh, lives by feeding off red blood cells and destroying them. Um, but this one's actually not super dangerous. If you have a pre-existing condition, it can harm you, but for the most part, people who get it don't know they have it. Um, so it's not quite as harmful as the other ones are. Uh, this is another Borrelia. This is Borrelia miyamotai. Um, so it causes similar symptoms, but it's a lot, lot lower probability of getting it. It's a newer one that they've really started tracking since 2015, so there's not a whole lot of data on it yet. And then, I don't know, I have a lot of you, yeah? Do you know where that one was first identified, the miyamotai? I don't. Um, I know it's in the Northeast. All of these ones I'm talking about are in this region, um, but I don't know where it was first identified. Yeah. And then the Palisson disease is the map that I have here, so you can get an idea of where those cases are. Um, they're really low. These are all 1 to 10 cases spread throughout the Northeast. Um, but Palisson is a little more dangerous, so it's a virus, which means there's no real good way to treat it if you get it. They can't use an antibiotic to treat it. Um, it doesn't always lead to severe illness. Sometimes it'll just give you flu-like symptoms. But if it does lead to severe illness, a lot of the times you end up having to go to the hospital um, to be helped with breathing or heart issues, and it can be fatal. I think they said it was fatal in 10% of severe cases. Um, so it is something to be concerned about, um, and so this is one that can get passed on with the black leg tick as well. A lot less common though, the Lyme disease. 
All right, um, so that's kind of my overview of ticks. And so I want to talk a little bit more about our research, uh, how we do our research, what it looks like, what kind of things we're finding right now. Uh, and so I want to start with kind of our research techniques. How do we do this? How do we get on the ground? How do we get an idea of what's going on with ticks? Uh, and the primary way we go about approaching this is with something we call tick drag surveys. So this is kind of the three pictures put together. And so what you can see is one of my old technicians here has um, a cloth sheet. So it's usually about a meter squared. And then they'll drag this sheet along the ground through the vegetation. With black-legged ticks, when they're looking for a host, what they'll do is called questing. And so they'll climb to the top of the vegetation and they have two legs with essentially sharp hooks on the end that they'll wave around looking for something to pass by. And so with this sheet, we can get them while they're questing, which is what that behavior is called. So we'll drag that along the ground and then you identify tick species and life stages at set distances. So for example, um, some of the old research I did, we would take that drag, drag it for 50 meters, and then look for different ticks on it. Um, collect the ticks, note how many adults we had. You could do it by sex, you could do it by life stage. Um, just get an idea of what the density is in that area. So it's not a true density, it's not telling you every tick is collected within that, but it gives you an index of you know, where has more ticks, where has less that we can work off of. So the CDC is really popular for this for obvious reasons. Um, so across the Northeast, a lot of people who do tick research will send their ticks out to the CDC. Uh, and the CDC tests standard for, I think, at least four pathogens from black-legged ticks. Uh, I think five now, actually. So they'll test for your, um, your Lyme disease. They'll test for your anaplasmosis, babesiosis. Um, Borrelia miyamoti has been added now. I'm pretty sure they do um, Powassan disease as well. Um, so they'll get you that data back. And you, so you can send it to the CDC, and they'll send it back. Pretty expensive though, it's not really something that you can do as the public, but as a researcher, it's an avenue you can go. Um, a lot of labs as well will be able to do their own research on this. So there's a, a technique here. So essentially you start by extracting your DNA. Um, so that's what's going on in this picture, is you take your ticks back to the lab. It's pretty hard to see it in here, but all of these ticks have to be cut open. Their shell is so strong that you can't dissolve the DNA without cutting through the shell. So you have to cut through the shell to expose the innards of a tick to extract the DNA from it. So we'll do that, and you incubate them overnight to extract your DNA, and from that you can do a few different things. Um, so now qPCR, I don't know, how many of you have heard of qPCR now? A few of you probably have. They use this for COVID testing as well. So if you get a COVID test that goes off to the lab, it's done through qPCR. So qPCR is very common for any kind of pathogen detection. And so essentially how it works is you take your DNA that's been extracted, um, you create these kind of sequences that will bind to your pathogen of interest, so they only will connect to the DNA of a pathogen that you're interested in. And it's interesting because you use these fluorescent tags. And so essentially what happens is if your DNA that you're looking for is within the sample, um, it'll shoot a light beam at it and it'll glow. And so essentially it'll glow to tell you that the sample you're looking for has a pathogen that you're interested in. And so that's really common now. qPCR is pretty easy to do. The machinery is not super expensive, so more and more labs have access to it. Um, there are other uses for DNA as well. Um, so one of the things we did at West Virginia University is we looked at past blood meals. So what I mean by that is we could take ticks that were questing and looking for their next blood meal. We could extract the DNA from them, and we could identify what wildlife species they had fed on before um, the previous one based on blood that was still within the tick. Um, not a high success rate. I think we were like 10% of ticks were successful. So you're talking to send a lot to get a little bit of data. But it is a way that things are going now. Um, another one is looking at tick evolution. So people are starting to, we were just talking about this today, are starting to sequence the genome for ticks. And so you can get an idea of what ticks evolved from. Um, but more, more where things are going is you can tell how in the US ticks are related to one another. So you can tell where populations are connected, where they're not connected. And so when I'm talking about like southern black-legged ticks being different from the northern ones, that comes from this evolution and DNA research where that's really been found. So along with those two that kind of give you your tick information, there's a whole plethora of other things that can be done with tick research. Uh, so some of it will be field-based work. I guess most of this that I have up here is field-based work. Uh, so this first picture here, this is called a, a mid-story cover board. And so all that board is, is it's a way to predict how much mid-story there is in an area. So you can see one of my old techs here holding this board up. And all you do is you predict how much of that board is covered by vegetation. So in this one, you would say about 5% of the board is covered by vegetation. In other places, you would say about 75, 90% would be covered by vegetation. Depends on the different landscapes you're in. That's a way to get an idea of what the forest looks like, what the habitat looks like. 
Um, there are other things where you can measure your canopy cover. So there's a mirror you can actually hold and it'll reflect the canopy down and let you predict or calculate how much of the canopy is covered by vegetation. Um, all these kind of different metrics you can get to go into your research to help. You know, all the things I was talking about with those habitat relationships before, those wildlife relationships were done to these kind of techniques. Uh, next, we have a camera station here. Um, so what these camera stations were set up for is basically twofold. So we have a camera that was face down. So you see this cover over it was, protect, was to protect it for rain because um, they were getting drowned by rain over the battery covers. Uh, but what we would do is we would put bird seed underneath it, have the camera here, and then we could look at small mammal populations. So we could see how many mice came to the feed, how many squirrels, how many chipmunks, look at wildlife diversity that way. And then we had a secondary camera that was faced out over a scent lure, and that let us look at things like coyotes, foxes, deer, um, larger animals that might come through. And so those are two of your more uh, non-invasive techniques of getting out and looking at wildlife populations and habitat. Um, but finally, sometimes you go the old school way and you actually go and trap. Um, so here is a chipmunk we trapped. So all of this research is from my doctorate at uh, Fort Durham Military Installation. Many of you have been there. Um, and so we would trap these different small mammals. Uh, you would basically hold them and you would search them for ticks. So you would look for ticks around their ears, around their throat, around their neck, their head. And that gave us an idea of how many ticks were on these different species. Um, and then we could also test those ticks for Lyme if you were interested or you know, do different things with them. Yeah? So for the small mammals, did the, um, did the little mammals eat the ticks on the rest of the body? Why the ticks are mostly around their head? That's the hardest area for them to reach. Uh, and so if I have an image later of where to search on yourself for ticks, it's kind of the same kind of picture. Um, so that's the area that's not really well groomed off because they can't reach it. Um, but then it's also areas like down under the neck, around the ears, where you have like cavities, you know, things that can hold moisture better, are better protected and shielded from the environment. Yeah, so that's why those regions. And then also it's to standardize it because you, you don't really have the time to search the whole animal. So you have to have like a standard area to search so it's more consistent. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about our research here at Dartmouth. Um, and so our research at Dartmouth is really reliant on other states' data sets. Um, so I've been collaborating with uh, Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, and Vermont. And so all of these states have uh, either the state system or academic institutions have provided their data. And so these are active tick surveillance programs. So when I talked about the tick dragging earlier, these are states that go out with tick drags and they cover a known area and collect ticks. And so they have these data sets. Um, if you look at Maine, their data set starts in 1989 and goes to present. It's a really nice long-term data set. Uh, New York is the second best. It starts in 2008 and goes to present. And then the other states have, you know, kind of splatterings here and there of what data is available. Uh, and so we partnered with these states to get these data sets. And they essentially told us the ticks that were collected by sample date. And then the total area sampled for ticks. And so that gave us an idea of how many ticks were on the landscape in these different areas. Along with that data, a lot of them have this pathogen prevalence or the number of ticks that were infected. And so we were able to get that data as well. And from there, you have to go in and you actually have to process your data. Um, so the way we did this is we try to standardize things so that you can compare different regions, you can compare different years to see what's going on with the trends in the data set. And so we totaled the ticks collected and the area sampled for each county per season. And so we define these tick seasons as for nymphs. You know, like I said before, they're primarily out in June and July. Um, so we use the New York seasons. So New York defined what a tick season is for their sampling. And so that ranged from May to September. And then for adults, their season was from October to December. So we use those to standardize everything across the data set. We're able to calculate ticks per an area. And then for pathogen prevalence, we just said, okay, we know how many ticks tested positive. How many is that out of the total percentage tested? We were able to do that every year to look at how these things changed. Uh, and so you're actually the first group that I've shared any of this data with outside of the collaborators on the projects. Um, so here's kind of a, a preview of what the data looks like so far. Um, so this first one we're looking at here is our nymph density. So this is the number of nymphs per hectare. Uh, a hectare, you don't need to worry about it too much. It's just a unit of area. I think it's 10,000 meters squared, maybe 1,000 meters squared. Uh, but it's just kind of a standardized unit that can be used in research because we all go with the metric system. Um, and so we can see that this data goes back to about 1991 for NIPS in Maine. And then we can see in 2008, New York gets added to this. So these are all the different states in this data set. 
your black line is an annual average. And so what each dot rep represents is the number of ticks that were collected within a county per that year. So every dot is an independent county in that state. So that's kind of just a, a scatter shot of what our data looks like. And so what you might think you're seeing with this is you might see an increase in tick abundance over time. And so actually what's going on with that is that Maine was the only state sampling in this early time period. And so Maine tends to have less ticks than these other states. So we see this sharp increase here. And so this trend here is due more to low, low number of data and the fact that we only have one state represented. And so when we actually went through and looked at this by state, we found no change over time in NIMS per hectare. So our tick populations are pretty stable in the area. Uh, the reason for that is because by the time most counties started collecting tick data, the ticks were already there and established. So what we're seeing is ticks come up to about a set level. They'll fluctuate around that level based on year-to-year -year conditions, but there's not an overall increasing trend going on within the area. Things seem to be pretty stable. Then we're also able to take that and we can look at an average NIMS per hectare across the area. So here's kind of our map with each county. And so you can see one of the things I should have pointed out in the last is um, this is a logistics scale. So if you look here, it goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Um, the reason you have to do that is because you get these really high extremes in tick abundance. And if you don't scale in that weird way, you can't see anything else in the data set. Everything else gets compressed by those extreme values. And so if we look across the area here, um, these gray areas are places that were sampled but no ticks were found, so that's a count of zero. Um, that might be a little misleading in Vermont here. I'm sure most of you know that there are ticks in the region. Um, and so what's actually going on in Vermont is that their sampling included time in May and June, but it was primarily done in April, um, September, October, time when adults were out. So their data set for NIMS is just not that strong. It's um, so you can, you can kind of discount Vermont when we're looking at NIMS per hectare. I do have adults per hectare. They have good data for that, so we'll see that in a minute. Um, but the other thing you'll notice in this data set is areas with this high elevation, so this would be in the middle of the Adirondacks here, tend to have lower tick abundance. And this is what I was saying before, too. If you look in the northern Maine, um, this area still has low tick abundance. So this is an area where you know Maine samples in every county every year now. And so they're sampling and they're not finding ticks up in that region. So that's where ticks are still kind of moving north um, within this data set. But why does New Hampshire have so much white? Yeah, um, sorry. So white is where we just don't have data. Yes. Um, so, you know, Massachusetts doesn't really have active tick surveillance. Um, Rhode Island uh, haven't been able to get their data sets. I know they haven't. But, um, and then in New Hampshire, what's going on is uh, UNH is the one who ran this research. So there wasn't... Um, uh, New Hampshire is starting up statewide tick surveillance, but this is like the first year of it. So it's still something that's coming online now. Um, so the data set I have is from the University of New Hampshire from a researcher there. And because it was at UNH down on the coast, they sampled in the five counties around them. So there's good like three or four years of data there, but it's not throughout the whole state. Yeah. And so going on to adults, we see kind of a similar trend here. So we can see Maine early on has the lower abundance. Uh, but then once we add the other states, we see it kind of level out. Um, so there's really no change over time in the adults either. And then like I said, this data set is more robust for Vermont. Vermont has better sampling for adults than they do for NIMS. So now you can see that the abundance of adults is pretty similar to what you have just over the border in New York. So it's pretty, it's pretty seamless between those two different states. You still see the same trend though, where you get into these high elevations, these colder areas, where there are lower tick abundance still. So. Over time, those areas might come up, but for the most part, things are pretty saturated throughout this region. All right. Um, so I also have data on the pathogen prevalence. So this is Borrelia burgdorferi. So this is our Lyme disease. And so you'll see early, um, this shouldn't surprise you, but there's not great data on pathogen prevalence within ticks on this early data set. Um, testing wasn't as commonly done back then. They were testing a subsample of ticks. And then, of course, Maine just was on, on this train a lot earlier than most states were. So it's a bit patchy on this early part of the data set. But even as we move into 2008, what we do see is an increase over time. And when we actually ran models, we see that Lyme disease is increasing over time. Borrelia burgdorferi within ticks, I should say, is increasing over time is what this tells us. So even though our ticks aren't changing, our number of infected ticks is changing. So there's still an increase in uh, the ability to get Lyme disease over this kind of time frame that we're looking at. 
Where's Vermont? Where's Vermont on this one? Uh, Vermont is not on this one. Um, so this comes back to that problem with their nymph data. So their nymphs, there were very few sampled, so there weren't very many to get pathogen surveillance from. But then the way the data set was set up, it was hard to separate out nymphs from adults in their data set. Um, they're on the adult one now. And so here we have the maps. Um, I'm just going to spend a minute on this one. We don't need to get too in the, in the weeds here. But we're able to basically put this out, and we can look at pathogen prevalence and ticks across the landscape. Um, so what you'll notice here is we do have regions in Maine for these couple pathogens. Um, that's due to a smaller study at uh, the University of Maine. It's a really cool forest project they were working on, again, how ticks change um, due to forest management. Um, and then you can kind of see, you know, Borrelia miyamotii. Like I said, sampling for that only started in 2015, so not as many states have sampling for that where the data set didn't overlap with one that was common to test for. Um, that just gives you an idea of what we can do with these other ones. Um, so anaplasmosis or anaplasma uh, phagocytophyllum and Babesia microti, Babesiosis, we found both of those to be increasing as well, but they aren't increasing as fast as Borrelia is. Um, and then Borrelia miyamotii, we didn't see any change over time. That's a very small data set to look at. In adults, we see that same trend. Um, so one of the things I'll point out here is if you look at our average, so this is 50% here. So we're seeing about 50% of adults are infected with uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, so about half of every Half of the adult ticks in the landscape are infected with this. So if you get successfully fed on by an adult, it's more risky because they're more likely to have this. But once again, it's easier to find adults. So less people have adults successfully feed on them to completion. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. Sorry to flip back on you here. I should have pointed out before. When we come to NIMPS, so this is 25%. And we can see 25% is about what the average is up to now. So about half as many NIMPS have Borrelia burgdorferi as adults do. Uh, which is what you would expect, because an adult is fed twice, a nymph is fed once. Adult just has more opportunity to pick up the pathogen. So that's what we're seeing in this trend. We can see Vermont is on this one, because like I said, they have stronger adult data than nymph data. So we have them on this. And then they also have done a good job of testing for the other pathogens. So while we don't have their nymph data, um, when we have the adult data, we have it for all four pathogens. So we can see how all four of those go across the region. Um, the adult trends are the exact same, so we're seeing an increase in Borrelia burgdorferi, um, we're seeing an increase in Anoplasma phagocytophyllum, and Babesia microti. So all three of those pathogens we're seeing increase in ticks, but once again, the increase in Babesiosis and Anoplasmosis is lower than the increase in Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme disease. So that's kind of what I've been working on for the past eight or ten months, is gathering these data sets. I'm trying to put them on the same footing so that we can actually look for trends in data and put them across space. So that's been a core of my research at Dartmouth so far. Um, some of the things we're working on in the future is we want to study how host movement really influences the system. So we know that hosts move and we know that that movement will actually take ticks and move them across the landscape. So that can be part of the way these pathogens can move, can be part of the way that ticks um, get into new areas, infest new areas. Um, so if we're looking at this picture here, what this is, is this is a predictive map of white-footed mouse habitat. So as you move towards red, that's areas where you're more likely to find good habitat for white-footed mice. So this is saying that these regions are areas where white-footed mice can do well, and if you move towards blue, that's areas where white-footed mice don't do as well. And so what we're doing is we're trying to do these predictions of habitat suitability for these different species, and then use that to look at the movement and how movement might influence ticks and Lyme disease. So this is one of the next steps we're working on at Dartmouth with modeling. Um, some of the other things we're working on is we're looking at modeling pathogen spread in ticks. And so the idea with looking at pathogen spread in ticks is, let's say we take an area um, that has ticks, but there's no pathogen within that tick. If you introduce a pathogen, how long does it take for that pathogen to come up to, say, 50% in adults, like we see for Borrelia burgdorferi? How long does it take for a pathogen to get established if ticks move into a new area. So that's another project that we're working on currently. Um, that's with Dorothy Wallace, who's a mathematician at Dartmouth College. And then we also have another researcher who's working on Lyme disease associations. So rather where, you know, I work with tick data, pathogen prevalence data within ticks, we also have people who are working with Lyme disease case counts. And they're trying to see how those Lyme disease case counts relate um, to, you know, different cities, to features within those cities. So that's some of the other work going on at Dartmouth College. So with that, with talking about the research, I want to take a couple minutes and talk about prevention, what you can do to be safer around ticks 
and Lyme disease. I figure that's a good way to wrap this up and kind of tie everything all together. So we're going to start with personal protection. What can you do personally? What can you do for your kids to help them stay safer around ticks when they're out in the landscape? So once again, when we're talking about nymphs, we're talking about primarily June and July when they're present. So that's when you really need to be the most cautious. Adults, you'll see in uh, March and April, maybe in early May, and then you'll see them again in October, November, December, basically until you have solid snowfall, you'll see ticks again in the fall, the adult ticks. Um, so that's when you need to be most concerned. So the first recommendation, most of these are from the CDC, is to wear white, light, white, wear light colored clothing. And so the reason for that is to make sure you can see ticks that get on you. You'll be able to see the dots climbing up you. If you wear dark clothing, they can blend in really well. So make sure you're wearing light clothing when you go out to these tick habitats. Uh, what this picture is showing is that you want to tuck your pants into your socks. It looks ridiculous, but it's super helpful. Um, the reason you tuck your pants into your socks is because ticks will crawl upwards. They don't tend to go down when they're questing or looking for blood meal, they're heading up. So when they get on you, they're going to go up, and if your pants are tucked into your socks, they'll go from your socks to your pants, and they have to travel farther before they can access you as a person. Um, so that gives you a better chance of finding them and pulling them off of yourself. Uh, the CDC also reply, uh, recommends applying insect repellent. Um, they say that it will reduce the probability that a tick will choose you or feed on you, um, that it will repel them away from you. I don't know that I necessarily believe in this. Um, I, I think it's a good idea, like why not do it? It's an extra step to take, it's pretty easy. Um, but ticks, ticks are very opportunistic. They're feeding on what brushes against them, so I'm not convinced that an insect repellent would really stop them from getting on you and feeding on you. Um, how many of you have heard of permethrin? Pretty much all of you. Um, so that's another good option to use. Um, so what permethrin is, is it's basically an insecticide or an acaricide, so it'll kill ticks that come into contact with it. But you have to be careful with it. Um, it is you know, basically poison that you're putting on your clothing. Um, so you spray it on your clothes, it'll go on wet, and then you have to make sure that you wait for your clothes to be dry before you put those clothes back on. Um, otherwise, it can be dangerous to people. Um, and it's especially dangerous to pets. I know they recommend not using it around dogs, so be very careful around dogs if you're using permethrin, especially when it's wet. When it's dry, it's safer. Um, some people won't use it because it is poison, but it does work very well. Um, I always use it during my research, and I pretty much never had a tick. Um, actually on me. So very effective, but you gotta be you gotta be careful with it. Yeah. If my pants, socks, and boots are treated with permethrin, would I still want to tuck my pants into my socks? Yeah. Yeah, because essentially what that would do is that would cause the tick to have to travel farther along that treated surface. Mm -hmm. You have a better chance of killing them. Now theoretically going across the boot and sock should be enough, but it would be safer. Yeah. Does yeah. it actually kill them or does it just make repel them? No, it kills them. Um, so this actually gets into the pores on the tick. Uh, I'm not sure. Because um, I know, like, I found dead ticks in my bed the next day. Um, but it didn't feed on me, so it died fairly quickly. I don't know. Um, yeah. Get a question back. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but for folks who have concerns about treating themselves, you can buy commercially treated clothing or, yes. or, mail, or mail your clothes off to have them treated. Okay. And, and, they, and they, my understanding is the protection from the permethrin lasts a lot longer it does. if you have it commercially done. I wasn't going to talk about that, but I will. Um, so if you treat clothes with permethrin yourself, it says they last about four to six washes. So you have to you know, maybe retreat them once or twice a season. Um, not, not terribly difficult. It's pretty easy to do. Just make sure you do it in a well ventilated space. But like he's mentioning, um, I think the main company I know of is Insect Shield. And so what Insect Shield does is they sell clothes that are pre-treated. Um, the good thing about that is it's supposed to last 40 to 60 washes. So you're talking about, you know, like a full season of being protected. Um, maybe even a couple of years, depending on how often you wear the clothes. So there is a benefit to buying those, but it's going to, you know, it's going to set you back more than the clothes you already have. So. And you can mail your own clothes in, too. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah, know that was an option. Yeah. yeah, it's like 10 bucks. I think it's 10 bucks for like water yeah. pants or pair of socks or something. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Does it still last the 40 to 60 washes? Or is Actually, it... I, I, the figure I have in my mind is 72 okay. for the US EPO. Gotcha. Yeah. Have yeah. you heard of the Olympic product? I haven't heard of that one. So no. Game, Game High, they a company that uh, the Olympic might be their product, but uh, it, it makes all the same claims, but okay. I don't know how. Gotcha. Probably a similar chemical would be my guess. Yeah. Um, and so the last one that really. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to put a plug in for being proactive and doing the drag. 
if you have a yard that's swollen, um, I have probably 150 ticks that have picked up. Yeah. Yeah, and there is um, some volunteer project. I know Maine has it too, where you can sign up and do tick drags in your own yard and contribute to research. I don't know what there is in Vermont for it, but. Do you know anything about the backyard tick treatments that people are putting yeah. up signs? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll do that in a second. Yep. Uh, so the last one is to perform your tick checks. So this is really the most important. Like if you've been out in the field for a day, um, check yourself for ticks. I'll have an image up later of showing where to check, but you know, around your ankle, around your waist, um, you know, armpits, uh, all of that fun place to check. Yes, all of those are the good places to check for ticks and make sure you're doing that. Because um, really the sooner you get them off, the better. As I mentioned before, it can take over 36 hours for Red Lake or Dwarf Fry or Lyme disease to transmit to a human. So if you can get them off in that window, you have you have a bit of time to, to get it done. Hot shower or bath, does that do anything? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think of the um, the net full body netting suit? You know, that, that, um, I don't know anybody who's used them. Um, I, I use the pants. Yeah. And every time I come in, I, I find a tick on it and I, and I pull it off. Um, so they get out of it at the, you know, down at the feet and at the waist. So it just doesn't give access. Yeah, I haven't, um, I haven't used them. No. Okay. So, question about the shower. Would salt water do anything to that? I don't think so. No. I wouldn't because expect I know it to. in the tropics they like to ride their horses in the ocean to get rid of the ticks. Okay. Um, I, maybe if you submerge them for long enough, but I, it would have to be longer than the shower, I would imagine. I don't know of it doing anything. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about, two how to remove a tick, but really the most important thing is to get it off as fast as you can. So, um, if you want to use a shower to do your tick check, I used to always do that. Like, you got to get a shower anyway, do the, use that time to check for ticks, great. Um, but I wouldn't rely on something like that to get the tick off of you. Yeah. So, there are some options you can do around the home. Um, so I'll talk about what you asked about in a minute, um, but a lot of these are just recommendations and actually, uh, so this picture is from this old house, they actually have an article about how to like tick proof your property. So you can look that up if you're interested in reading more about it. Um, but kind of the keys are to keep your grass and your brush short, so that's basically going to keep ticks uh, from having good habitat, but it also means if ticks get in your yard, they aren't going to be able to climb up and get better access to you. They're going to be under your foot level and have a harder time getting on you, so keeping things cut back is really helpful for that. Um, you can also create a barrier between the woods and the lawn. So if you look here, they have the wood chips spread throughout. And so what those wood chips do is they make it harder for ticks to move across that. Um, with the wood chips, the area will heat up faster. Um, the sun will more directly hit it, getting it hotter and making it drier. So ticks have a hard time getting across that type of barrier if you can put it in your, in your landscape. Uh, you also want to limit your brush piles and maintain your firewood. Um, the key reason for that is you don't want to promote mice near your house. You don't want to promote the chipmunks. Chipmunks are also really good at passing on Lyme disease. Um, so things like this that you can keep away from your house um, is better. I did want to discuss the spraying options. Um, I haven't done too much with them. There's companies now that are advertising uh, basically natural remedies. I don't know how well they work. I don't know much about them. I just know that I see the signs everywhere, especially in Norwich, Vermont. They're all over the place. Um, there are also places that will spray pesticides, and I know the pesticides definitely work. Um, the problem with pesticides is that, like everything else, the more you use them, the more resistance you're going to make. So as you spray more and more pesticides to kill ticks, um, the ticks will get more resistant to those pesticides. So they've actually found, I think it was research on ticks on cattle, um, that they built resistance over time as these things were continued to be used. Uh, so that might be the same with natural remedies. It might not. I'm not 100% sure on that. And so those are what you can do. Um, on a bigger scale, we can manage wildlife. Um, so if you're actually going out and you're working in these areas, um, some of the things you can do is you can manage small mammal populations. So maybe limit um, cavity nests if you want to limit mice or chipmunks, keep places for them to breed lower. Or uh, one of the things I recommended was promoting predators on the landscape. So if you're talking about small mammals, um, you're mainly talking about raptors as your predators. So these are a couple goshawks. Um, we sampled up in the Adirondacks. Uh, so you can kind of promote predators in a couple different ways. So, and I'm talking more like, you know, your wildlife manager managing, you know, a wildlife management area or a state park, or that's more what I'm talking about with this wildlife management. Um, but you can open your canopy, and that will make raptors more efficient at eating small mammals. So if you reduce your tree cover. Um, some places will also put out perches, because when you put out perches, it'll attract these raptors, which can then feed in the area. 
Uh, just having them present, like I said, will lower the mobility of these small mammals. So the less those small mammals move, the less likely they are to pick up ticks. One of the last ways that's been studied with wildlife is actually um, treat wildlife. And so essentially what they're doing is they're taking something like the permethrin substance and applying it to different wildlife species. Um, so then there's some bait boxes now for mice, and you can actually buy these as residential homeowners. Um, I don't know how effective they are. I probably wouldn't go for it. I would go for more of the habitat management stuff that I talked about around the home. Um, but essentially what they do is they pull mice in using some kind of bait, and then they'll actually apply a pesticide to the mice to kill any ticks that are on them. So the benefit of that is that instead of just taking the mouse away and the tick maybe feeding on something else, you're killing all the ticks that are on that wildlife species. Um, similar systems have been built for deer uh, to kill ticks that are on deer. Uh, for managing habitat, you really just want to manage clearings around the trail system, so keep it cut back so that, for example, with this trail, you can see all the grass growing up around the edge. You want to make sure you're not brushing against grass when you're coming down these trails. So if you can keep cutbacks, um, that'll really help. And then some of the things I talked about earlier, you know, canopy cover, understory are really beneficial to ticks. So if you can reduce those, those things help. Um, there's some places now that are doing prescribed burns, so they'll actually burn out the habitat. That can be done more for nutrient cycling and wildlife purposes, but it does help ticks stay in lower abundance. You have to burn about every two to five years to keep tick numbers low, they'll we're down pretty fast. Um, and you can promote alternative habitat types. So ticks are mainly found in these forested areas, so maybe you have more grasslands. Um, or maybe you have areas that they would call like a parkland where you have grass under tall open tree areas. When you're removing ticks, uh, you really just want to get the tick out of you. So you want to use tweezers, grab close to the skin, and pull that tick out. Um, so any of the things you've heard about, about like applying petroleum over top of a tick to make it release, um, burning it with a match to make it let go, you don't want to do any of those things. Your goal is to remove a tick as quickly as possible. Um, so you're going to take tweezers, you're going to grab as close to the skin as you can, and you're going to pull the tick out. That is the best way to get a tick off you. There are tick keys, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. They do basically the same thing as a tweezer, just might be a little bit easier. And so pull upward with steady pressure. And then if the mouths separate, it's not really a huge deal. You want to do the best you can to clean that out. Um, but if you can't get all the mouthpieces out, your body will reject it over time. Um, and so as long as you've got that tick removed before really or door fry before Lyme disease migrates up to those mouth parts, you're still going to be safe because it lives primarily in the gut. And so then after removal, um, this is the image I've been talking about, so I won't really go into it any, but these are the areas the CDC recommends checking for ticks on yourself if you're doing a tick check. So just keep that in mind. Um, but you really want to clean the area with rubbing alcohol or soap and water. So you just want to make sure that's not getting infected. Um, obviously the ticks carry some pathogens, but then just general infection from having an insect and berry in your skin, you want to avoid that. So make sure you're cleaning it out after you remove a tick. You also want to monitor for a rash around the bite. As we said, this rash only occurs in 70 to 80% of cases, but it's good to keep an eye out for it because it's a really a telltale sign that you could have Lyme disease. You might also want to identify the tick species. So like I said up here, a lot of it's the black-legged deer ticks. There are some other species in the region, um, but different ticks carry different diseases. So if you know what tick you had on you, you have an idea of what what diseases you might be um, susceptible to, what might have potentially been passed on. And really, you want to consult with your doctor. Um, most doctors anymore, if you get a black leg, a tick on you, they're going to go ahead and put you on an antibiotic. Um, some of them won't. Uh, that might depend on how long the tick fed, but a lot of them are proactive now, and they're going to put you on an antibiotic and make sure they get it taken care of. Um, you don't want to miss it and have it de uh, develop into more chronic Lyme symptoms um, that a lot of people have problems with. And then, like I said, I wanted to talk about potentially getting the tick tested. I know that's something you all were interested in. Uh, University of Maine does it. Actually, I actually have a friend that works at that lab. Um, and that funding goes back into tick research, so that's really cool if you want to do that. Um, but CDC actually recommends not doing it. Um, and the CDC says not to do it for a few different reasons. Um, when you're talking about pathogen and detection, you can have false negatives. And so if you send a tick in and it comes back negative, it doesn't guarantee that the tick was negative. The tests are pretty accurate anymore. But if you get a false negative, it might make you think that you're safe when you're not. Um, so the CDC recommends going more to a doctor than sending your tick in for testing. And then also, a lot of these labs aren't really managed. Um, so they're, you know, they're not like under a federal government agency control. They're more independent things that are popping up. Like I said, I know the people at University of Maine, they're really great. Um, they do this kind of work. I shouldn't be 
so I don't know as much. Um, but you have to be careful with where you might sign your ticks to, and it's better to just be more proactive, go to your doctor, and let your doctor help you decide what your treatment is, than rely on getting a tick tested. Plus, the tick testing has a turnaround time, which you know you might not be safe during. Like It can take a while to get a tick tested and get the results back. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everybody who's helped me with this research and this project. Um, like I said, I've only been here about eight to ten months, but I've had the joy of working with all of these different people. Um, so at Dartmouth College, we have a really great tick group that's working on a National Science Foundation grant. Um, so we're doing research through that. So I get to work with everybody at Dartmouth. But then we're also working with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, University of Maine, Maine Health Institute for Research, and the University of New Hampshire, along with uh, the New York State Department of Health. And so all of those states are the ones who have provided us with data and really let us get this work done. So I want to thank them for their help with this research. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. I have a question. Um, a while back, in one of the slides had um, some of the hosts, you know, chipmunk and a and a very and a cat bird. Yeah. I was like, what are the birds doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so birds will can actually catch and pass on Lyme disease, um, but additionally. So even if a bird doesn't have really bird or fry, even if it doesn't have the pathogen, um, they've been found to move ticks that are infected. And so they think that one of the ways that uh, the disease is jumping around and moving to new areas is by the ticks latching on the birds and the birds moving them. So there's more and more research going on to birds and ticks feeding on birds. Why those two birds and other birds? Yeah, um, so those were the two that were part of that research project, but then also those were the two during that research project that did a poor job of grooming ticks off of themselves. Because okay. birds tend to be pretty good groomers, but those two were higher up in the percentages, which is why they made that graph. I don't think of a bird that nests in the leaf litter. Mm -hmm. um, That's what most of the research is focused on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it was curious about you know Maine not having, you know some of the northern parts of Maine not having as many ticks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are, we hear a lot about the moose and getting covered with ticks. Yeah. Are those not? They are not. Um, so they are a different species. They're called a winter tick. Um, and so those, you know, maybe that's where that question came from. Somebody asked if um, ticks can stay on a wildlife species over the entire winter. Winter ticks do that. Um, so winter ticks are a different species. And what happens with the moose populations is they'll get hundreds to thousands on them. And essentially they destroy too much energy and the moose are dying. But that's a completely different species of tick. And I don't, that's not really my area. So I don't know too much about them. I always wonder walking through the, the forest and through the brush, um, if there's a if there's a, a branch up here, the tick can be is there a height that they don't go above or I know it's an average is around yeah. knee height, right? But did they ever get up by your head and on a branch there? You know, I've heard people say that they do. Um, the C D C doesn't really buy into that. Um, there was an article I read just the other day about Christmas trees because people were thinking they were bringing ticks mm -hmm. in their home on Christmas trees. Um, but what it actually was was a look-alike. So it was a species that had um, like a black body. It was small. It looked kind of like a tick. It wasn't actually ticks coming out of the Christmas trees. Um, it's thought to be more like grasses and shrubs that those ticks are going to come up on rather than trees. Uh, yeah, so probably around waist height. Waist yeah. height. Yeah. And so the other thing you'll, you'll notice, or another thing that goes on, is that nymphs won't quest as high as adults. So adults are bigger. They have more energy. They can climb higher, which is part of the reason they also feed more on deer than nymphs do. Any other ticks carry the um, lime? Yes. Um, so the Lone Star tick has been found to carry lime. Um, those are down in Connecticut now, but I don't think they've been found north of the past. Not as far as I know, at least. In Massachusetts, lower than Massachusetts. They found them there, too. Okay. Uh, but it's primarily the black legged tick that it's, that it's in. Yeah. Um, how about the other diseases that, um, that black legged ticks can be carrying? You said that. Um, for Borrelia, yeah, the, the bacteria kind of uh, lives most of its life cycle in the gut, so it takes a while to reach the salivary mm -hmm. gland, so you have time to find the thing and yeah. take it off of you. Is that the case yes, for other things? not. Um, so I don't know exactly which one is which. I don't know how long all of them take. I know we were talking about the palisone the other day, um, and that one can transfer in, I think, as little as 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, the more proactive you are, the better. But once again, the Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme disease, is the most common one. It's the one you're most likely to get exposed to, which gives you, you know, a buffer on that at least. Yeah. 
My doctor said uh, she got Lyme disease and the pronunciation was better for two hours. And I had been hearing, you know, it has to be on for 24, mm -hmm. 36 hours, but, um, but in her case, apparently, you know, it, it was a streamlined case. Well, and you know, one of the other things it could be is that she, or that the doctor had a second tick that they didn't notice. Maybe. So that, that's another possibility with something like that. Yeah. Um, with those adults out there in winter with their climate changing, you know, let's say we get, we're in the middle of winter and we get a scenario where potentially the ground's unfrozen and there's no snow cover. Could, yeah. could you potentially pick up an adult yes. at that time? Yep. So the adults, um, yeah, basically anytime you hit a warm spot in the winter, if the snow cover goes down and the ground warms up, the adults will come out. Yeah. Because at that point, you know, the primary time for finding a blood meal is in the fall. So they're being more opportunistic later on in the year, but they will take advantage of it. Um, there's some research saying that when you have these wild springs in winter, um, when you get warm, the ticks will come out. And then if the temp drops hard again, it'll kill them. So there's actually some research saying that this kind of up and down temperature is worse for ticks because um, they, uh, they do better with, you know, constant temperatures and snow protection to help buffer them from the temperature. Cats and dogs, okay, going outside community. I, mean, so I guess I just thought of the second question though. If, if, if that tick has a blood meal on your cat or your dog, mm -hmm. are they going to get you after that? Or Not very likely. Yeah, but okay, so how, what do they recommend for treating animals um, or cats and dogs? Yeah, um, so. I, that's not really my area. I do have a dog though, so I've heard some of it. Um, so they have one now, and they're actually thinking about using this for humans. There's some trials on it underway. So, you know, um, there's vaccine trials for these now um, that are coming to humans. And then one of the ways they're looking at it is the same way that it's with pets. And so what this drug does is they give pets, they give it to them once a month. And what it does is it kills a tick that feeds on them. So the tick brings in the blood, the blood has something from that medicine that'll actually kill the tick and the tick will fall off before it's had long enough to transfer any kind of disease to the pet. So that's one that's getting recommended a lot by vets now. But then there's still the topical treatments. So there's still like the liquids you can put on the pet once a month. And then there's the collars that'll last eight to 10 months. Um, but a lot of them are pushing that, that pill now that basically gets in the bloodstream and those things. Like I said, they're, they're starting trials up for humans on that as well. I just want to mention one other hazard. I got Lyme carditis last summer, um, where the spider took the parapet and embedded in my heart and was an intensive care for five days. So um, it's apparently only one out of every hundred that get, get it, but it can be a little. Yeah, you really want to be proactive with Lyme because once, once you miss that initial sickness and it gets farther into you, it can really cause a lot of problems. Um, it can be really hard to clear if you don't clear it initially, so it's better to be proactive on getting medicine and getting cleared up for it. Um, there's been, there was another case I was reading where a woman had had Lyme disease and they thought it was treated, and then at her autopsy they found it in her brain, I think, or her spinal cord. Yeah. So it's, it's really best to get it treated as soon as you can um, and to be really proactive about finding ticks and removing them. But those vaccines should be out in the next couple of years from what I've heard. And they're trying like three or four different trials. So um, I would imagine at least one or two will make it through. So the vaccination you're, vaccine you're talking about, is that also the, the medicine that's available to dogs right now? Um, so there's a couple different ones. So one is a, a vaccine, and I think it's a three-shot series. Um, but they do work in a similar way. So there's like a series of vaccine that you can get. And what it does is it doesn't stop the tick from feeding on you, but it kills Borrelia burgdorferi. It kills the pathogen within the tick. So what happens is the tick feeds on you, it pulls up this vaccine from your blood. That vaccine kills the pathogen. And so the pathogen dies within the gut of the tick before it has a chance to spread to the person. So that's one of the ones they're working on that's really interesting. And then the other one is like oh, what I was talking about, which is more like an oral medicine you'd have to take every so often that'll actually kill the ticks that feed on you. Um, some of those are in early trials. Some of those, like I tried to sign up for one of the Lyme vaccine trials, and they are full of participants for right now, so they're moving through that series. Um, but yeah, they are moving forward. And there's a few different approaches they're taking to see see what works. Yeah. So there's one available for dogs because the restrictions aren't as tight for animals? Yeah, that's part of the reason why. And um, the original Lyme vaccine, because there was one that came out in like the late 90s, um, it had it hit a lot of backlash. Like there were anti-vax groups that pushed against it to help get it shut down. There were some lawsuits against it, even though it was found to be safe. 
Um, and then there was also a lack of interest. So people saw it as something that was like posh, so like rich people would go get this vaccine. And so that went against it. So even though it was a safe vaccine, it kind of got shut down for these other reasons. And now they're starting to move back through as Lyme disease has increased to do new vaccines. Okay, at this point, we'll wrap things up. Folks can stick around if you want to come up and ask a couple other questions, but uh, let's give a round of applause.